Welcome to this presentation from the Loving Art website on the experience of disability in the visual arts. This presentation was first shown at the Greenbelt Festival uh, towards the end of August in 2023. We're going to begin from a position that art is about exploring and expressing life. That's not supposed to be a definitive statement about art, but it's a good one to begin with. We're saying that art is about life and all the experiences of life. Art can explore the beauty or the terror of the natural world finding metaphors in living things. And here is Van Gogh's 1888 painting of sunflowers. It's an exuberant painting created with passion in dazzling colors. Art examines the beauty of the human body and the beauty of common activity. Here we have Matisse's The Dance which gives us a vivid sense of movement and of shared joy. And art explores the uniqueness of individual lives. Here is a portrait painted by Leonardo da Vinci of a certain Cecilia Guiarani, who was mistress of the Duke of Milan. He painted it around 1490, and it has come to be known as the Lady with the Ermine. Art celebrates the spectacles and the occasions of life and what are often called genre paintings of ordinary everyday life. In this painting, the artist Renoir paints a dance at the Moulin de la Galette in Paris, one of the repurposed windmills in the Montmartre area. Now, artists have always drawn on their own life experiences to inform and to shape their art. And some of those artists have lived with disability. This is a contemporary portrait of the artist Michelangelo. As far as we can tell, Michelangelo was never diagnosed during his life with any disability. But psychologists and others have examined his writings and what others have said about him. And they conclude that he was a highly functioning autistic person, that he very likely had Asperger's syndrome. When we look at his work though, such as this Pieta in St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to see any obvious sign of those disabling aspects of the artist's life. This artist is perhaps more well known uh, than Michelangelo. This is Vincent van Gogh. And people may know that van Gogh suffered throughout his life with psychotic episodes during which his perception of reality was quite at odds with the perception of those round about him. At one time he admitted himself into the local mental asylum for treatment. And Van Gogh also experienced what psychologists call synesthesia. Uh, that's a condition where a person seems to receive one kind of sensory input with the organs of another. In Van Gogh's case, he reported hearing colour as music. Here is his famous painting, Starry Night, and we can draw our own conclusions about what kind of input is at play here. And this is Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. At the age of 17, he had a riding accident which broke 
both his legs. And this, compounded with a growth condition which he had inherited, resulted in his lower body ceasing to grow. Because of this, his father disowned him. His father had wanted him to pursue a military career, and that was now impossible. But his mother sponsored him. She paid for him to move to Paris and continue his art studies, although she may not have known uh, that he used her funds to establish himself as a semi-permanent resident in the brothels of the Montmartre area. He painted the women who worked there and he painted the dazzling nightlife which was taking Paris by storm. This is the nightclub of the Moulin Rouge. Here's another French artist. This is Henri Matisse. Matisse was diagnosed with cancer in his later life and the surgery which had extended his life also paralyzed him from the waist down. Because of this, he spent his last 14 years confined to his bed. And from that bed, he developed an art form which is known as decoupage. He would tear shapes out of colored paper and instruct his assistants as to how they should be fixed on a large canvas at the end of his room. And that's precisely how he created this very famous work of his, known in English as the snail, or l'escargot in French. But none of these artists, although they were disabled themselves, brought, as it were, their disability into their artwork. None of them were painting about the experience of being disabled. To find that, we need to turn to a different set of artists. And here is Frida Kahlo in this very attractive studio portrait photograph of her. Frida Kahlo was a Mexican artist. She was passionately political, a member of the Communist Party, and brought into her art lots of the influences of the indigenous peoples of Mexico, her own Roman Catholic heritage, and some of the ideas which were circulating in Europe about the use of colour. We're used to seeing portraits, self-portraits of Frida Kahlo, like this one. She's surrounded by exotic foliage. She has a monkey and a perhaps a panther uh, behind her. And she stares out of the painting at us with her famous monobrow. This is another portrait. Not always easy to tell with this picture whether this is her dressed as a bride or as a corpse ready for burial. Her face is surrounded by a large elaborate ruff and on her forehead is an image almost like a tattoo of her husband. We see so many of these portraits, exotic in their colours and their content, looking almost like contemporary icons, that it's easy to imagine this was all that Frida Kahlo produced, but that's not true. At the age of seven, she was diagnosed with polio 
and she spent her childhood years uh, with her legs in iron braces. And then towards the end of her teens, she experienced a catastrophic road accident, which shattered her spine and her pelvis. The rest of her life was a series of painful, uh, unsuccessful operations, which often made her situation worse. Here is one of the paintings she made of the experience of being disabled. We see two images of Frida here. On our left of the painting, she lies on a surgical trolley. The lower half of her back is exposed and we can see painful surgical scars. On our right of the painting, she sits apparently composed, wearing traditional Mexican dress. And in her left hand, she holds the body brace, which she wore all the time to keep her back straight and to maintain her posture. In her right hand, <clears throat> she holds a little flag and on it are written some words from a popular Mexican folk song. In Spanish, Abol de la Esperanza Restante Ferma. The tree of hope remains strong. Set in this fractured landscape, which looks like it's exper experienced um, an earthquake, watched over by what looks like a dying sun and a dead moon. And there's still a note of hope which she expresses in this painting. At one point in her life, Frida became dangerously thin and underweight and she was ordered to eat. She was made to be force fed to build up her strength and her size and she made this quite disgusting and disturbing painting of herself lying on a bed with a funnel placed in her mouth and into the funnel is being poured offal and dead meat and skulls and all sorts of things travelling through the funnel directly into her mouth and into her body. During her lifetime, Frida's art attracted a lot of attention, not least amongst surviving members of the Surrealist group who wanted to adopt her. Now, the Surrealists had been concerned with exploring the life of dreams, the world of the subconscious. But Frieda insisted she was not a surrealist and she said, I never painted dreams. I painted my own reality. And a large part of her reality was the experience of pain and frustration with the limitations that her disabilities imposed on her. This is a painting which she created in 1944. She calls it Broken Column. It shows us a half-length portrait of Frida. Her body is presented as being beautiful and well-proportioned, except that it is fractured down the middle with a great split or tear. Her body is actually held together by that same body brace. And inside her body, we can see a stone column. And we imagine that this is what is holding her upright. But when we look more closely, 
we see the column is beginning to crumble. And Frida wrote of herself, I am not sick, I am broken. So here we have this clearly talented, imaginative and richly creative artist who produces stunning, if intriguing, self-portraits, but also explores areas of physical pain, of mental torment, of frustration. So what might we expect to find in some of her later, in fact, her final works? Here is the last work which she signed as being completed. And it shows Frida sitting in a simple room on her wheelchair, soberly dressed, with a bundle of paintbrushes in her right hand. And in her left hand is a palette. On closer inspection, the palette looks disturbingly organic. It looks like a small human organ, perhaps a kidney or the heart. As though Frida is telling us that her art originates at least in part from what's happening inside her body. But beside her is a portrait of the surgeon who supervised her treatment during the last years of her life, to whom she felt she owed a great deal. This is Dr. Farrell. And uh, Frida painted this in 1951. And in just a couple of years, she was gone. So she leaves us with a body of work which expresses on the one hand an exuberant joy of the beauty of colour, an almost sensual delight in presenting herself to the viewer, and on the other, a rather stark and disturbingly intimate insight into her experience as a disabled person. If we feel that her life was in many ways marked with tragedy and perhaps rather understandably introspective, our next artist is quite different. This is an American artist who is still alive today. This is Riva Lira. Riva Lira was born in 1958 and she was one of the first spina bifida babies who were treated after her birth. Uh, traditionally, babies born with spina bifida had been simply made comfortable and inevitably their lives were very short. Riva Lira survived her infancy and spent the rest of her life somewhat like Frida Kahlo, undergoing painful and sometimes quite destructive operations. And yet there is a cheerfulness about her that we see in this studio portrait of her. She gathered up again around herself a, um, a number of friends who themselves were disabled and also artists. And they soon commissioned her to create portraits. This is the portrait which Riva Lira created of her friend Theresia de Gene. Uh, she always collaborated with the sitter when she created these portraits. They had a contribution which they made to how the work should pan out. And Theresia de Gene was a thalidomide baby. She was born without arms and grew to be a successful international human rights lawyer. Um, Riva Lira has quite mischievously put this friend who has no arms halfway up a tree. 
There's no explanation of how she actually got herself out of the tree. But perhaps that's the point, that this lady, who was disabled, achieved the unexpected. In her autobiography, Riva Lira makes a quite extraordinary statement about disabled people. She refers to them as the monsters of modern society. And she says in her writing that a monster's body is a space in which we consider the boundaries of the acceptable. And we see that to be so true when disabled people are brought to prominence in public life. Many people will remember this sculpture by Mark Quinn. He created it in 2005 um, to go on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. Uh, this you will see is not Trafalgar Square. Uh, this is when it was moved to the Venice Biennale. This is Alison Lapper, pregnant. A large statue, sculpture of a pregnant, nude, thalidomide woman. There in Trafalgar Square, uh, surrounded by thousands of tourists and Londoners. And the butt of many critical comments, was this a suitable subject to make any sculpture of? Should an image like this be seen in public? In fact, Alison Lapper herself talks about her pleasure in being portrayed this way. And we see her looking resolved and defiant almost on her plinth. Can't help feeling that Riva Lira's portrait of her friend is a little warmer and perhaps a little more compassionate. Here's another of Rue Valera's friend. This is the German journalist, Rebecca Mascos, who she painted in 2001. And she has uh, Rebecca seated on a wall here. Uh, she's uh, quite accurately uh, depicted her muscular and enlarged arms and upper body. And she sits on this uh, snow-topped wall holding a bluebird's feather and uh, obligingly a bluebird, an American bluebird, flutters above her right shoulder. And it's quite clear when we look at the body of work that Riva Lira has produced, which is often largely commissioned portraits of her friends and associates, we can't avoid the feeling that she is celebrating and rejoicing in their very existence and in their achievements and makes no attempt whatsoever to hide their disabilities but sees it as an essential and undeniable part of their existence. We get a slightly different picture of the experience of disability when she paints herself. This self-portrait was created in 2013 when she was 54 and it shows a quite painful and uncomfortable, disturbing image of the artist as the puppet of some invisible puppeteer suspended from the frame above her by strings or cords which control her movement. And we see her tearing at these cords with her clenched fist and her teeth. In 2011, Riva Lira produced this self-portrait. She called it Colouring Book. 
And in it, she depicts herself as a full length nude figure uh, seated on uh, a difficult to define surface. But she is significantly surrounded by a collection of what look like little paper dolls. She writes about this work that the dolls represent parts of her body or physical functions which have either been removed or have been modified surgically throughout her life. And in many ways this is not a comfortable image although she doesn't appear to feel any malice towards these little dolls or the experience of having them there and it's almost as though she's telling us that in her life she carries with her all of those experiences of having parts of her removed or changed and in some way by their very absence they remain with her so here is an artist who shows us a celebratory attitude towards the experience of being disabled the significance of being treated by some people in society as though they were monsters by someone who wants to express joy and admiration for the achievements uh, that some of her disabled friends have made not to patronize them as though they were having a go and doing their best but saying simply as a human being these people have excelled and have made a difference And we're going to turn to a British artist now. This is Tony Heaton. Uh, Tony Heaton is a sculptor and um, he creates installation pieces. And he is also a political activist on behalf of disability rights. In 1994, Tony Heaton produced this piece of work which he entitled Great Britain from a Wheelchair. A couple of things that we might notice here. Um, he's uh, enjoying a pun on um, the title um, that he gave to this piece. It, it is, uh, if we're generous, it's a, an outline of the British Isles uh, made up from the parts of a National Health Service wheelchair. But he also declares, I'm going to be showing you Great Britain as it appears from the perspective of somebody in a wheelchair. Tony Heaton is, in the sense of an activist, quite an angry person, although we see from his photograph there that he has a great sense of fun and joy. And we find that in his work. He's also one of the people who lays claim to originating the phrase, nothing about us without us, insisting that the various organizations and institutions and charities which exist on behalf of disabled people should actually include disabled people in their decision-making and their management. Now, this is an installation piece created by Tony Heaton in 2014. It's a small three-wheeler car which has been sprayed gold. And on the license plate, we'll see the word lame, uh, a French word borrowed by the English and used to mean of gold appearance. Now, the car is quite interesting because it's a copy of a car which was introduced onto British roads in 1948. It um, was known as the Invercar, and that in itself was short for the phrase invalid carriage. It was designed and developed to meet the needs of the many uh, disabled service people who were uh, left after the war 
and it served a whole generation of disabled drivers until the 1970s when it was taken out of production. There's an interesting play on words here that people will have noticed. The word Lame, if you remove the acute accent on the E, becomes the word lame. And Tony Heaton writes of how he has been fascinated by the medieval practice of alchemy, where people sought to transform ordinary objects into gold. And he uses this as a metaphor uh, for the realization of the potential of disabled people. This is an interesting piece of sculpture by Tony Heaton, which he entitled Loop, which was first exhibited in 2005. It uh, is a collection of large discs or tube-like structures um, uh, in bold colours. Uh, there's a white one, a deep purple one, and two shades of orange in the picture here. And on these discs, these loops, is printed the word loop. Now, of course, the interesting thing about this image, certainly for British viewers, is on having given it a cursory glance, they will have immediately assumed that the word read polo, because that's the name of uh, a British confectionery, which looks exactly like this, except that the word printed on the side is indeed polo and not loop. So what is Heaton trying to do here? In very simple terms, he's challenging our assumption that we understand something by giving it the briefest of glances. He says that uh, when we look at disabled people, we make assumptions about them, we reinforce our prejudices about them with those assumptions, and fundamentally, we misunderstand them. What we need to do is take more time. So Tony Heaton, the sculptor, the activist, demanding changes in society in the way that disabled people are viewed and treated. In fact, Tony Heaton has also had a hand in the online presence of disabled artists, certainly in the UK. He was one of the founders of Shape Arts, um, along with Disability Arts Online. They promote the um, pursuit of the arts by disabled people. And they stand alongside um, a number of activist groups as well, um, amongst them uh, the UK Disability Arts Alliance and Action Space for Artists with Learning Disabilities. That's important for me to add at this point that both Tony Heaton and Riva Lira kindly gave their permission for those images of their work to be used in this workshop and presentation, and they both sent their best wishes for the Greenbelt Festival. So there we have three artists, three disabled artists, three disabled artists who use their art to explore and express their experience of disability. Frida Kahlo, Riva Lira, and Tony Heaton. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Here's a scattering of QR codes if you'd like to explore more of the work of these three artists and also the QR code for the Loving Art website. Thank you for watching.